All right. So um, first, um, we'll we'll discuss about aligning sequences and um, this the tools that we need to score alignments, such as substitution matrices and gap penalties. And then in the last part of the chapter, we'll describe uh, database search methods that where we have to do sequence alignment in a in a fast way because we don't want to spend uh, too much time. Uh, aligning with every sequence in every, in uh, very detail. So why do we align sequences? Um, we align them to figure out how similar they are. We want to identify whether they are related uh, evolutionarily uh, or functionally. And when we want to know which residues correspond to which other residues. Okay, so if you have two long sequences, you want to know uh, how they match up. Um, a problem uh, that is of significance is to find unique microarray probes. So you are designing a microarray uh, where you would like to measure the expression levels of genes, but you want to have a probe on each uh, microarray cell that will be unique to a single gene. Otherwise, you won't know the expression of genes uniquely. Okay. So you want to specifically design a probe that will be complementary to a gene sequence. Um, so you want that to be very different from other, other genes. So again, uh, here we, in addition to looking at similarity, we also look at uh, how different a gene will be or a probe will be from all the other genes. In shotgun assembly, where we have um, read the genome in very short sequences, then we would like to combine these short sequences into the longer genome. Um, these short sequences will overlap only at the ends, so they will be a, there will be a very uh, small overlap between them, and that overlap will be identified using uh, sequence alignment. Um, once you have a species, the genome of a, of, the, of a species, you want to know which other uh, genes, which genes are similar in other organisms, in other species. So again, you want you need to compare their sequences and identify which parts are similar. If you have a set of sequences, so not just two, but multiple sequences, you want to know uh, what's the motif responsible for um, causing a certain function. Okay, so how do which part of that, which part of their sequences is responsible for a biochemical function, and how can you capture that um, the essence of that sequence in a in a so-called motif uh, that we can more easily interpret. So there are two types of homology that uh, we are we usually focus on. One of them is divergent evolution, and the other one is um, comes rise uh, from convergent evolution. In divergent evolution, we have a shared ancestry, okay, and things diverge over time. All right, so they share the common ancestry, but then they diverge over time. And uh, in biology, we usually, uh, especially in sequence alignment. Uh, we might use the terms homologous and similar uh, interchangeably, even though they do not mean the same thing. Okay? So homology has an evolutionary implication. It means that those species evolve from the same ancestor, um, but similarity just means their sequences are similar or, or they are similar in some aspect. Usually similarity will, uh, will uh, entail homology, but not, that's not necessarily true. Okay? In convergent evolution, um, we have a structure or a function that uh, have been that has been acquired independently. The example to that is the wings on the bat, the wings on the uh, butterfly, and the wings on the birds. All right. So these uh, structures have were not acquired because because they came from the same ancestry. They were um, discovered independently. All right. So these uh, species discovered flight uh, independently. All right. So there was a speciation event first, and then uh, the acquiring of the flight uh, property. Okay, so there are some terms uh, that we use to describe the homology relationship between uh, different genes. Um, orthologs are genes that are similar due to speciation. Let me see if this works. Yep, it does. So in this um, species tree, and we, we are also listing the genes, 
there are the speciation events uh, give rise to different types of species. Okay, so there's one there, um, there's one here, and there are two here. So if you look at the bottom branch, we have mammals on the left, and we have snake uh, on the right. Okay, so there's a speciation event, um, mammals separate from snake. Okay, and uh, when we look at the, um, the tree of a gene, Speciation events can be seen, but gene duplication events make it uh, make this interpretation more complicated. Gene duplication events is where within the same organism, within the same species, you have another copy of the same gene. Okay, so in this case, we have the alpha hemoglobin and beta hemoglobin. So there was a gene duplication event here, where alpha hemoglobin, and so we, we got two copies of the same gene. On the left, we have the alpha on the green branch, and the, um, on the red branch, we have the beta hemoglobin. Okay? So this similar, the, these two sequences are very similar to each other. Okay? Um, but if you go down lower, you will see the, the, the speciation events. But these speciation events are, um, you will see them in parallel. So frog gets separated, and frog gets separated. Okay? So if you look at the sequences that we have nowadays, without the knowledge of uh, gene duplication, things get very messy. Let's say you have the frog beta hemoglobin, okay? And you have the um, mammal alpha hemoglobin, all right? So you will, you will take a look at those. They will not be as similar as they are between snake and mammal, all right? Okay? Or let's say you, you have the... Um, frog alpha hemoglobin, and mammal alpha hemoglobin, and snake beta hemoglobin. If you just uh, generate a tree of those, a similarity tree, you will see frog here, human here, and uh, snake here. All right, so frog and human will appear to be on the same branch. They will look closer in evolution, all right, if you didn't have all the copies of the genes. So alpha hemoglobin, alpha hemoglobin, and this one was beta. All right. So that similarity is due to the fact that uh, we are looking at the alpha hemoglobin genes in those two organisms, whereas in the other one we have the beta. All right. So this tree shows um, how similar sequences are. It doesn't necessarily show um, the exact uh, branching in the evolution for the species. So we have to be careful when we are in, when we are looking at gene trees, and uh, always keep in mind that it doesn't um, need, it doesn't need to exactly match with species tree. And to get the species tree, you need you also need to identify all the gene duplication events uh, in the evolution. All right. Okay, let's get back to our figure. Um, so the copies of alpha and beta hemoglobins are called paralogs. They are, um, they are due to gene duplication events. So there was a single gene that got duplicated within this ancestor organism. We, had, we got two copies, and after uh, that organism um, had two copies, then it uh, differentiated into different species that both acquired those two copies from their ancestor. Okay? All right. This lamprey has a single copy of the hemoglobin, which means uh, the speciation event was, um, it happened before the alpha beta hemoglobin is duplicated. All right. Okay. Um, a third and special type of homology is uh, xenologs, where we have horizontal gene transfer. And that's where you have one species or one, let's say, parasite um, invading the, the host organism and, and integrating its genome with the, with the hosts. And from then on, the host will, will keep uh, replicating. And um, if that's in the, um, if, if the um, integration gets um, over the next generation, then you have the horizontal gene transfer where, where one where a gene from one species is transferred into the other into the other organism. Horizontal gene transfers um, happen. It doesn't have to happen uh, over the 
over a long time of evolution, we, we see this horizontal gene transfer in bacteria a lot. Okay. Uh, the plasmids get, get transferred from one bacteria to the other. All right, so that's uh, called that's, that can also be considered horizontal gene transfer. Um, also, in viruses, a viral gene may get integrated into the um, host organism. All right. So over the evolution, sequences diverge. DNA sequences uh, change and we get different sequences in different organisms. The, co the sources of these variations can be um, errors in, uh, in uh, gene replication, error in um, when the cell replicates. Okay, so the replication errors. Uh, in the last lecture, we saw that there was a one in a billion error rate. Uh, so it's a very high fidelity mechanism to replicate uh, DNA, but we still get errors. Okay, so there are some replication errors in the next generation. Um, things will be slightly different than the previous one. Okay, so the DNA sequence change because of the replication errors. There are also some chemical reactions uh, that change that modify the genome. All right. So let's say you have a reactive oxygen species will which will um, damage the DNA and change it. Insertions or deletions in the genome happen. Um, and that this can, this could be due to viruses also, all right. So a part of the genome will can can be inserted in a different part of the genome, or during replication you could have um, a portion of the uh, genome replicate more than a single copy. Okay. All right. The duplications can happen at the gene level, so you can have a single gene duplicate in its entirety, um, just part of a gene can be duplicated, and those are uh, domain duplications and exon shuffling events. You could have an entire chromosome duplicate, and that could be due to um, when, when the chromosomes segregate into different cells, um, one cell might get more than one copy. And the, the term that we use for when the entire chromosome is um, Duplicated, we call it polysomy. Part of a chromosome could be duplicated, so that's called partial polysomy. And an, and an entire genome could be duplicated, and we call that polyploidy. All right. Um, so some organisms have multiple copies of the genome, and um, in humans we we have two n, meaning for every we have two copies of each pro, each chromosome. But for some, especially for plants. Uh, they can have 6N or more, okay? So they have multiple copies of the same genome. And each of each copy will be slightly different, right? So they are not identical. Because they replicate separately, they are uh, under these sub uh, replication and chemical uh, strains separately. Uh, they will have um, slightly different sequences, all right? Okay, when we have uh, sequences from different genomes or sequences within the same genome um, and we want to identify how similar they are, we have to perform sequence alignment, all right? So let's say we had the ancestor sequence um, called what sequence? And due to mutations, we, uh, we don't have this nowadays, so that's in the history. Um, it's in the fossils. If, if we sequence fossils, we might find it, but um, if not, we won't. Uh, and we might not have uh, fossils that are old enough to have that sequence. All right. So what we have nowadays is just these two sequences to work with. That sequence and, and this sequence. And when we align them, we find the residues that correspond with each other. Okay. So the assumption is that the residues that correspond to each other in the ancestor, they were uh, located at the same location, at the same position in the sequence. Okay? All right. When you have a, um, an insertion, one of the sequences will be longer than the other. So this is a sequence and that sequence. If you don't allow any gaps, the correspondences between residues will not be accurate. Okay, so the E 
will align with this one, whereas ideally you want it to align with that. Okay. So we have to introduce gaps in one of the sequences to allow uh, that shift so these, this part of the sequence aligns with the other one correctly. Okay. So depending on how we score gaps, um, how favorable gaps are, and how we score matches and mismatches, okay, a match is where a letter is the same as the other one, um, such as H with H. A mismatch is where you align things, but they, they are not exact, they are not identical. So A with I here is a mismatch. And a gap is where you have a dash uh, in one sequence and you have a residue in the other one. So this I doesn't align with anything. It doesn't have any corresponding residue in the other sequence. Depending on how you score a match, mismatch, and gaps, uh, you will get different alignments. You will get different optimal alignments. Okay, so here we, um, the gap score, um, this is a gap score, not a penalty, so you, uh, it's just plus one. Uh, usually you would have a penalty, so gap will be a minus number. If the gap uh, is scored um, low, just a plus one, you don't have as many gaps. If you increase this, that score to plus three, then adding more gaps becomes more favorable. If you increase it even, for, even further, you still get more gaps. All right? Okay, so depending on how these scores are relative to each other, different alignments will have, uh, uh, the, the sequences will, will align differently. And um, if you favor gaps more, you will get more gaps in the alignment. In the extreme case where a gap is scored better than a match, then for every letter you will have a gap in the other one. All right? And so on. So if you had uh, a match scoring 6 and mismatch scoring 0 and a gap scoring um, 20, then you will get a case like that. So uh, in, in this alignment, we, we, um, there's one restriction, we never align gaps with gaps. Okay, so a gap should always align with a, a residue. Otherwise, you can build um, an alignment that has an infinite score, right? Okay. So once you get the alignment, uh, the alignment score itself is a number that you can uh, use to evaluate the alignment. But there are also other ways. Um, the most commonly reported value would be the percent identity. So when you have two sequences, you would say they are identical um, 75%. Okay. So that means when you align them, when you find the residues that correspond to each other and see which ones are identical, 75% of those residues are identical. Okay. So in this example, um, for this alignment, you count the number of times that um, the residues match up. So you have 11 matches. And the length of the sequence, the length of the longer sequence, or I guess um, in this case we are using the length of the alignment. So the, number, the total number of positions here is 16. And you, you divide 11 by 16, you get 68%. Um, Okay, so these two sequences are 68% identical. Okay. Whereas this other one, um, where we remove this gap, so the AT moves on to that side. You have 10 over 15. You have 10 uh, identical positions and the alignment now is 15 residues long. So you got 66% uh, sequence identity. Okay? So the sequence identity level will depend on how you calculated the alignment. Another way to look at alignments is using dot plots. And that gives a visual uh, evaluation of the, of the two sequences. 
so on the right, you see the dot plot for aligning this sequence, and this is a sequence. Anytime you see a red dot, uh, it shows that uh, the, chorus, the residues from the two sequences at, those at, that at that position are identical. So T it matches with a T. You don't have any other T in uh, any of the sequences uh, that match up. All right, so if you look at the letter S, you have one here and one here that match up. Okay? So you put a dot wherever you have a match uh, between the two sequences. And if you um, finish that up and you look at, you step back and look at the alignment, you, can, you look at the dot plot, you will see some diagonal elements. Okay? So diagonals show that there's a long stretch of uh, identical residues. All right, and you have you see some off diagonal. If you see some off diagonal uh, matches, that means there is a shoulder stretch, and um, at those locations that are identical. So what? How would you interpret seeing a line like this? If you if you had dots like that, any answers? Yes, so one, if you have a, an anti-diagonal match, that means uh, that stretch, a stretch from one sequence is inverted in the other sequence. So it's like a, um, a reverse of one of the sequences. All right. Okay, a more quantitative way of measuring the alignment, uh, the evaluating the alignment is using the scoring matrix, which uh, will tell us how uh, not only how many matches we have, but also in more detail how compatible those residues are. And scoring matrices are usually more important, become more important when you are looking at, looking at protein uh, alignments uh, rather than DNA alignments. Okay, so uh, more on the dot plot. Um, if you look at a, a real uh, protein sequence, you will see a plot like this. Uh, we have many, many dots uh, all over the place. And uh, if you apply a filter, uh, a filter will be a, a window that you will um, scan over the dot plot. And you will only keep the dots uh, if within the window you have enough number of them. Okay, so let's say you slide a 5 by 5 window over this dot plot. And if the number of dots within that 5 by 5 window is at least, if you have at least three of them, you keep that dot. Otherwise, you remove that dot. So this will, this filter will help you remove uh, sort of um, single dots that are, um, that are not part of a stretch. Okay. Um, so removing the noise will give you a cleaner dot plot. Uh, in this, in this uh, case, it's, it's too clean but um, you get the idea. All right. You don't have to look at two different sequences. You can apply the dot plots to um, compare a, a sequence to itself. It's um, light enough, I guess. Okay. So when you look at, when you align a sequence with itself, um, you will definitely get the diagonal element, right? Because uh, things will be identical to themselves at, that, at, at the diagonal position. So you will surely have a diagonal line, but then you could have uh, some off diagonal elements right there. And those would be um, sequence repeats where um, a portion of the sequence right here was it's identical to itself, but it also appears at a different location. Okay. <coughs> and um, if you had an anti-diagonal match, that would mean an inversion, where this portion of the sequence um, was repeated, but inverted in a, in a different place. So, um, especially when you look at the protein sequences, uh, genuine matches do not have to be identical. So you could have two different letters, but it could still be a good match. 
because um, amino acids that different amino acids could have the same biochemical properties or similar biochemical properties. In this case, um, let's say you are aligning A with I, okay? Um, A and I, they are both hydrophobic residues, alanine and isoleucine. So they are compatible in a way. So aligning them is not so bad, okay? Uh, similarly, T and H, they both have a hydroxyl group. Um, and they are both polar, so they have uh, they are similar in their biochemical nature. So aligning them is not so bad, okay. But aligning T with A would not be as favorable. You have a uh, you have a polar uh, and um, amino acid with a site with a hydroxyl group, and you have a hydrophobic uh, amino acid. So they are not as compatible. So we need to capture this compatibility in uh, quantitatively in order to incorporate it into the alignment. Um, we have uh, some popular substitution matrices that capture this compatibility. Um, the most popular one is Blossom 62, and there's also one called PAM, P-A-M. So the Blossom 62 substitution matrix will give you a 20, 20 by 20 a matrix of scores where you um, where it lists how compatible amino acids are, or how would you or it tells you how to score um, a substitution of one amino acid with another. So to give an example, um, let's look at A with I. We have a score of minus one. Okay. If you look at um, W with A, you have a score of minus three. Okay, so uh, W is uh, it's a, it's a very large amino acid, it's a tryptophan. If you look at the diagonal, it has the largest diagonal score. That means a tryptophan uh, uh, likes to stay as a tryptophan, it doesn't like changing to other amino acids. So replacing a tryptophan with anything else is not very favorable. All right. So once we have this substitution matrix, then instead of uh, scoring each match with a plus one and each mismatch with a minus one, now we can use the substitution matrix to look up the scores and use those scores to evaluate our alignment. So here we are aligning T with T. Uh, T with T is plus 5, so that has a score of plus 5. H with H has a score of uh, plus 8. All right, so you can just look up the matrix, 8. A with I is a minus 1. <coughs> T with S is a plus 1, and so on. Okay, so you find all the scores, and then you add them up, you get uh, 52. All right, so you just add up these numbers to get 52. If you had a gap somewhere, then gap uh, would have to have a special uh, score, which is not listed in this uh, substitution matrix. So how do we get that substitution matrix? How can we derive it? One idea that has been uh, commonly employed is to look at, is to hand align a set of sequences so take um, a bunch of highly conserved, highly similar sequences and align them by hand. And then count the number of times one amino acid is substituted with a, with a different one. All right. So you take a, let's say, list of a thousand different alignments and you count the number of times that you see A replaced with an I. So in this figure, you see the example where we have uh, a bunch of highly similar sequences, okay? If you look at each column, it tells you how, in a way, how compatible those amino acids are, how likely they, um, they will appear in the same position uh, in, a, in a protein sequence. And then you count the number of times that an A would be replaced with a different, um, with a different letter. 
Here the letter C is highly conserved. Uh, that, that position doesn't give you um, um, any replacements. C is only kept, so you only get the information about C with C. The others, the other frequencies will be zero. So the uh, the way that we evaluate um, that we convert these substitution frequencies to a score is using log likelihood ratios. So this equation shows you um, observing a, an amino acid I replaced with an amino acid J divided by the background frequency of I and the background frequency of J. Okay? So let's say we are back here. Um, you will take a look at A with S. Okay, so let's find the number of times you have A replaced with an S. So you will count the num you will count the number of uh, these um, A S A S A S and so on. Okay. So how many times do you see A uh, replaced with an S? This will give you the P A S. All right, and then you also need to divide this by the background frequencies. So if you have an amino acid that appear um, in very high frequency, let's say A is uh, A occurs in proteins, uh, let's say 90% of the time. Okay, just by the nature of A occurring in uh, proteins 90% of the time, all of these frequencies will also be high, very large numbers. Okay, so you don't want the background frequencies to affect to bias your likelihood ratios. All right? So that's why you need to divide this with the background frequency of A multiplied with the background frequency of S. So when you are calculating the background frequencies, you just take, you just look at your sequences, all of your sequences, and you, you calculate what percentage of uh, the amino acids is A. All right, so we have um, 35 positions here. Uh, one, two, three of them are A. So the QA is uh, 3 over 35. Okay, so that's the background frequency of A. So the top part is things together. The occurrence of two amino acids appearing together or, uh, or being replaced with one another. And the bottom part is their background frequency separately. So this division tells you how likely it is to um, have I to, to have an amino acid I replaced with an amino acid J. The reason we take the log is for mathematical convenience, um, because then we can add these scores up. So if you have a sequence alignment. Like this one, all right. So T with T, if you find the probability of uh, having a T replaced with a T, then you can multiply that probability with um, the probability of replacing H with H. So let's say this is uh, X times Y, and so on. And if you multiply all the probabilities, you get the probability of uh, seeing this alignment, the entire alignment. But multiplication is not as convenient as addition. That's why we take the log of each one. So if you take the log of the entire thing, it's the same as taking log of x plus log of y plus so on. Okay? So instead of multiplying, then we can add this scores if we take the logarithms. Okay. Um, so you get these log likelihood uh, ratios and you convert them, you, you generate your scoring matrix from these, um, from these log likely, likelihood ratios. And this 1 over lambda is just a constant to uh, put things in the, in, in the scale that you want. Okay? <clears throat> so you repeat this with all i, j. We have 20 of them. So for i equal 1 equals 1, 1, you get a number. For i equals 1, j equals 2, you get another number, and you fill in this 
uh, matrix from the set of reference alignment. So the reference alignments give you these numbers, and then you calculate the log likelihood ratios to generate this 20 by 20 matrix. All right. So depending on um, what set of sequences you use, you will get a different matrix, right? And the way that they generated the blossom matrices is by um, looking at different sequence identity levels. So they collected a bunch of sequences that shared 80% um, similarity to generate a matrix called blossom 80. So these are generated from highly similar sequences. Okay. And then they looked at another set of sequences that had 45% sequence identity. So the, these blocks um, came from sequences that were 45% similar in their uh, sequence. Okay. And when they used those sequences and generated a matrix, they'll get a different one, and that uh, is generated from highly divergent sequences. So thing, the sequences that were used to generate Blossom 45 were more distant in evolution. Uh, Blossom 62 is uh, the most commonly used uh, matrix. Um, if you use BLAST, it's the default matrix that you will get. <coughs> All right. So why would you need why would you need to generate these different sequences? This, this, these different uh, substitution matrices. Why not just use Blossom 62? Any answers? Yes? Mm -hmm. Right. So if you are if you are comparing uh, two genes that are highly variable or, or they are very uh, distant, then you need to use a substitution matrix that can uh, accurately uh, score or accurately ev evaluate that uh, level of distance. Okay. So depending on what substitution matrix, substitution matrix you use, you'll get a different alignment. So the residue, not only the score will change, but the actual correspondences where one letter matches up with another letter in the other sequence will be different. Um, so the, the substitution matrix you use should match up the problem that you are trying to solve. All right. So for highly similar sequences, you could use uh, Blossom 80 uh, to align uh, very divergent sequences, you could use Blossom 45. <coughs> All right. But in most cases, um, uh, people usually ignore the, that difference and they use Blossom 62. Okay. All right. Another method for generating a uh, substitution matrix is uh, PAM. And that, that also has uh, a set of different um, substitution matrices. So PAM stands for Point Accepted Mutations. And instead of looking at the sequences just as a block and counting the number of substitutions, uh, PAM builds a tree for those sequences. Okay. And in a way, it's, it's a more accurate way of counting um, substitutions. So here we have this block uh, of four sequences. And they, uh, they each have five residues. And we build a tree uh, that, that sort of represents the evolutionary history of these sequences. Where your sequences are at the leaves, and um, you, connect, uh, you connect sequences that are very close to each other, you get an ancestor sequence, and then you connect those to get the root node. Okay? So this tree uh, represents the, um, the history that gave rise to these four sequences. So we had an ancestor sequence that uh, got mediated into these two sequences, okay? which then each of them got uh, mediated into two separate uh, sequences. All right. So there's a, qu a question here. Um, 
where um, because we don't have the intermediate steps, okay, we cannot really be 100% sure uh, because we don't have those sequences. So these are uh, inferred. So uh, in this example, we, you have a D here and an E here. But in the ancestor sequence, we place an E here because on the other branch, uh, that makes more sense because there's another E there. Okay? So that's not... Um, you can do... Um, you can get you can uh, have some assumptions, but you won't get um, you won't get the ancestor sequence with 100% accuracy, and you may not be able to get it 100% of the time. Okay. <clears throat> Usually, what they would do is um, you would replace that e with a question mark if you don't know if you cannot infer what it was. All right. But once you have this evolutionary tree. Uh, you can count the number of mutations along the along each uh, path. So let's look at the um, this branch. Here you had an E in the ancestor sequence, and it got replaced with a D. So that's um, a replacement of an E with a D. Okay. So again, you uh, need to count the number of uh, replacements, the number of mutations going from E to D, just like in uh, Blossom. Once you have uh, this, the number of substitutions, the equation is the same. The other branch is an example of A being replaced with a D. So the ancestor sequence had an A at position 1, which got replaced to uh, become a D. So to find the score of um, A being replaced with a D, you need to count the number of times A is being replaced with a D and divide it with the background frequencies of A and the background frequencies of D. Okay. Uh, so this um, matrix C just gives you the number of times that you see a substitution. And then you need, so that, that's the observed frequency matrix. And then you divide it by the expected frequencies, uh, which is the multiplication of um, frequency of A and then frequency D or any other pair that you are looking at. All right. So when you are building the substitution matrix and you want to find the value of uh, Sij, you need to find the observed frequency, which is the number of times that you um, observe I being replaced with J. Okay, and um, you divide it by PIPJ. Okay, all right. So there's there's one slight variation here, and that is we have the multiplication of that, um, and that this is because. Um, PAM has the exact evolutionary history, so you, you don't, um, you start with I and then you multiply it into J. So you have I to start with, you substitute with J. But in the, blo in the blossom, you don't, you don't know which one came first, so you count all of them. All right? So it's just a probability calculation. Um, you are given that. You have an I there, and you multiply it with uh, the frequency of replacing that I with a J. Okay? All right. Uh oh, I lost. Okay. All right, um, so, so far we got the substitution matrices. Um, let's take a short break and we'll keep uh, looking at the gap penalties. All right, so um, the gap penalty tells you is, is a number that um, lets you score the gaps.
once it shows up, I'll start talking. Okay. Um, so there are two common uh, gap penalty scores, and a fine gap is, is more realistic and it's used more often. In linear gap penalty, we have a single score for a gap character. So uh, observing a single gap, here is uh, denoted with the letter E. Um, actually, no. Um, let me repeat that. So E is the gap penalty, and then N is the number of gaps you observe. All right. So the when you have an alignment, the penalty for all the gaps is is calculated using the number of gaps multiplied by uh, the penalty for a single gap. All right. So this E is uh, how you would score a single gap, and then n is the number of such gaps. All right, so it's simple. You just uh, count the number of gaps, multiply them with your gap penalty. All right, or you, when you are adding up the scores of individual positions, um, a gap will be uh, added every time you see a gap. A gap penalty will be added every time you see a gap. But in uh, in the mutations that we observe in 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 real life, we usually don't see gaps occurring um, at a single location. Okay, usually gaps will be uh, a few a few um, amino acids long. Um, that sort of makes sense. Like if you have a protein structure, um, if you shorten the structure just by a single amino acid, it'll mess up the entire structure. But let's say you have a loop. Um, on the protein. If you remove that loop and close up uh, that branch, okay, so removing that, that loop is a few amino acids long. It's a gap that corresponds to, let's say, four or five amino acids. Okay, so the, the mutation events uh, usually happen for several amino acids, um, not just a single uh, point deletion, okay? So we need to have a, a gap penalty model, uh, the way, a way that we score gaps that reflect this, um, this phenomenon. We want to score a gap that is um, a single uh, residue, uh, not, um, and, and a gap that is, like, let's say, five residues long. But we don't want the gap that's five residues long to be penal penalized five times as much as the one residue. Okay, we want to penalize five residue long gap less than five times a single gap. All right. So we want a function that sort of um, uh, slows down over over the number of over the length of the gap. Okay. So we want a saturated function or a function that uh, where we penalize a gap opening more, but to Increased for for a longer gap, we don't want to penalize it as much. All right, so to to score that, we separate the two parts. One is to open a gap and to extend a gap. Opening a gap means um, you see a gap or not. All right, so the or you can uh, use the first gap position, the first gap character to be a gap opening. All right, and any consequent gap characters you see after that will be part of the extension. The extension is how long of a gap you have, and gap opening is that uh, reflects that you have a gap. So let me give you an example. Uh, let's say we have A, T, gap, gap, C, um, T, uh, gap, H, um, C, H. Okay. So here, if you use linear gap penalty, you will say three times um, gap opening penalty, gap penalty. But if you have a fine gap penalty, you are opening the gap, okay? So that's minus i. And then one minus, uh, sorry, number of gaps, gap characters minus one, so you have two left times e. So the first gap that you see in an alignment uh, is the gap initiation, gap opening penalty, and you use the rest 
to multiply with your get extension penalty. All right. Okay. And by using a gap extension penalty that is uh, penalized less than a gap opening, you uh, you will penalize opening a gap uh, a very high number, but you won't care as much whether that gap is four residues long or five residues long. All right. So once you have a gap that's more important of an event than how long that gap is. All right. Okay, um, when you are aligning two sequences, there are two, um, two ways to align them, and those are called global and local alignment. There's actually more that we will cover, but those are the two main terms. In global alignment, you take your sequences and align them in their entirety. Okay, so from one end to the other, you align the two sequences. You want to find a corresponding uh, residue for each position in one sequence and for each position in the other sequence. In this example, uh, this, uh, part B shows you a global alignment. So these are the same two sequences, PI3 kinase and uh, cyclic AMP uh, um, kinase. And global alignment aligns the two sequences in their entirety, their entire sequence. But local alignment focuses on a small portion, a small segment from the two sequences that are um, highly similar. So you pick out the portion that is uh, most conserved or most similar. So you get a shorter alignment. And you don't really care um, what the rest of the two sequences um, were. OK? All right. Because proteins are of different length and they are uh, sometimes composed of different domains, so one part of the protein uh, may be missing in its homologs, um, local alignment is more useful to compare such multi-domain proteins. All right. So if you align the t if you align proteins in their entirety, uh, you may miss some of the similarities. And uh, moreover, you are and for, you are you would be forcing alignment of portions that are not highly conserved, and they they will be very uh, different. And your alignment score will not be as good, okay? Because you are forcing the alignment of those uh, dissimilar regions. But if you do local alignment, then you will capture the similarity of these domains. Okay, so smaller portions will be aligned, but then you would all you would have to look at multiple local alignments to capture uh, all of such um, domains. Okay. All right. Um, another aspect to alignment is instead of aligning two sequences, sometimes we align more than two, and that's called multiple alignment. Uh, and let's say you have a, you have a viral gene, genome, and you have uh, sequenced uh, many different um, uh, many different samples, uh, and you want to align them and see which positions are highly mutated, which positions are highly conserved. To do that, you we apply multiple alignment. Okay, multiple alignment is not uh, simply using pairwise alignment multiple times. It's more complicated because um, pairwise alignment will not give you uh, the best, the best may not give you the best results uh, for the multiple alignment. So two common strategies to generate multiple alignments is uh, using a guide tree and uh, using divide and conquer approach. In the guide tree, at each step, we perform pairwise alignment. Okay, so we take our sequences, we find that. Uh, the two closest ones, in this case A and B, and then we pairwise align them. All right. So that's um, one branch right there. So A and B are connected now. Then we look at the next two sequences that are uh, most similar, C and D, and then we align them. Okay. Now A and B, instead of now they are represented as a group. 
uh, from then on we will not uh, we will not just consider alignment of A with let's say E we will consider both alignment of A with E and B with E so this this branch is now a group uh, they will be connected with either a different group or a different sequence okay all right so the next uh, the next most similar pair is E with the group CD. So we are adding the sequence E to this group. And it gets connected right there. And we get this um, CDE group. The next group that's most similar is AB with um, CDE. And we, we align them and uh, we connect them in the tree. Okay. So every time you find the next two closest pairs, and uh, each each item can be either a single sequence or a group of sequences, and then you connect them, they become a group. All right. So in this way, we can build this multiple alignment. All right. But once we align A and B we have these residue correspondences between A and B, right? So those never change as we align with other sequences. So if uh, residue um, 5 in A aligns with residue 10 in B, it will still align uh, with the same uh, B10 in the multiple sequence alignment. So once we align two pairs, that the, the correspondences of the residues do not change um, when we build up the tree or when we build up the alignment. Okay, so if we make an error early on, so if we make an error in the alignment here, those errors uh, propagate to the end, and they may make things worse because uh, an error location will force the other proteins that align with that group. To have an incorrect alignment. So the, the disadvantage of using a guide tree is that um, the errors that you make early on uh, stay the same and they propagate to the end. You cannot um, you cannot really fix them easily. All right. In the divide and conquer approach, we take uh, our original sequences and we chop them up into smaller parts. And uh, once they are small enough. Then we align those small sequences. And we can usually align shorter, smaller sequences more accurately than larger ones. Okay. So once we align the shorter sequences, then we combine, um, com combine them together to get the longer alignment. All right. So here it says align optimally. Uh, we have enough time, enough computational time to do a really good job on short sequences, and then once we align them, then we merge uh, the results to get the longer alignment. Okay? All right. Once you get the multiple alignment, it tells you, um, it gives you a lot of information. It, uh, for instance, tells you how conserved a position is. How important is it to have, let's say, the um, a letter A in a single in a position? Um, let's look at this this position right here. You have an L there uh, that is replaced with a V once, but for the rest of the time it it stays as an L. All right, so that tells you that. That specific position likes to be hydrophobic. Okay, it's, it doesn't mutate away from L very frequently. And you have Q and E. So again, you have a special um, special position there. Another position that's L all the time. It never gets mutated away from L. So it's really important for the protein's function to have an L that if uh, you replace L with something else, uh, it might mess up the protein's function or structure. Um, and it probably does. That's why we don't see it 
in in uh, in the sample that we have nowadays. If it weren't the case, then that protein would also be present in the current um, genome. Okay. All right. So multiple alignment gives you how tells you how important each position is and what uh, amino acids uh, um, are most likely to be present at uh, those positions. So this figure shows four different methods to align uh, five sequences. Depending on the method you use, you'll get a different alignment. All right. So sometimes uh, one method does not give you the best result. You may have to try different ones. Um, but for for the most conserved positions, usually they will agree. Okay. So depending on the problem you are asking, uh, it may be sufficient to just run one multiple sequence alignment method or um, or not. If you're only concerned concerned with finding the highly conserved amino acid, uh, usually all of them will give you the same result. Uh, if you um, let's say if let's say you are you are in more interested in the entire sequences um, and want to build up an evolutionary tree for for those genes, then um, it makes more sense to, to to invest more time and run different methods to see what you what result you're going to get. All right. Sometimes the errors would be obvious, and uh, you, you might be able to uh, point the er find the errors by eye. Okay. Sometimes not. All right. Sometimes you could have additional information. Uh, let's say you know the functional site from in these proteins. Then you want the, then you would want the multiple sequence alignment to align those functional residues in the same position. Or let's say you know the structure of these uh, proteins. Then you would want the same alpha helical region to align uh, across different proteins. Okay, so there are some ways to validate uh, the multiple sequence alignment or to even enforce aligning those residues and then having the multiple sequence alignment align the rest for you. You can take the multiple sequence alignment and uh, generate a sequence profile. So let's say you have a functionality, uh, a protein uh, kinase functionality, and you collect a set of sequences. Um, in this case, we have four sequences in the top profile and 31 sequences in the bottom one, you generate a sequence profile that should, that tells you how um, how many times you have an S in the first position. And it looks like uh, for all of the four sequences here and for all, the, for all the 31 sequences here, the first position is always an S. Uh, position 8, if you look at just four sequences, uh, it's always an A. Uh, but if you look at uh, 31 of them, you get some uh, other letters in there. Okay, there are some other possibilities um, at that location. But the number of proteins you look at uh, will change things. Uh, usually the more the better. But um, you may stay away from the more uh, in cases where you, don't, you, you want the computation to be quick. Um, aligning too many sequences will, may not your, your method may not be able to handle it. Okay. All right. So these sequence profiles uh, provide signatures for the families of proteins that they are coming from. And you may find the enzymatic amino acid by looking at these profiles. So if, if you have a set of proteins that are from the same family and they function in the same way, uh, you generate this profile if there's a if there's a location or a stretch of locations that are uh, highly conserved and they are very strict about which amino acids they should have, then those residues are usually at the active site and they are resp responsible for the biochemical reaction uh, that those pre those, protein those proteins are responsible for. Okay. We um, have different ways to represent these profiles. The sequence logo where you have those letters with different heights is one way. Uh, regular expressions is a more 
uh, flexible and easily searchable way to represent profiles. So in this representation, you have amino acid letters, but then you have some positions that are variable. Okay. Um, so here it says you have a leucine followed by X represents any amino acid and you want six of them. So in parentheses you list the number of times that you want the preceding amino acid to occur. All right, so we have a leucine, we have um, six amino acids. We don't care what it is. It can be any type of amino acid. Followed by another leucine. Followed by six more amino acids. Leucine, six more amino acids, and then leucine. Okay. So this is a signature for a leucine zipper, usually uh, occurring in uh, transcription factors, um, where you have two um, alpha helices that form a, sort of a zipper where leucines are pointing at each other. They, they sort of form a zipper shape. Okay. So two, uh, two of these pro, two of these signatures, two of these proteins will will be um, forming a dimer with each other, and that's why we call them leucine zippers. In the next example, we have um, a tyrosine kinase phosphorylation site, but now we have um, multiple options for a location. So an X was any any amino acid. In square brackets, if you have uh, two or more amino acids, though, those are different options you have. So at this, at the first location, we need an R or a K. Okay. So we could have either one of them, followed by any two amino acids, followed by a D or an E, followed by three amino acids, followed by a tyrosine, followed by the letter Y. Okay. So this uh, phosphorylation site has two different uh, signatures. In one of the signatures, you have uh, two amino acids here and three amino acids there. In the other one, you have three here to that. Okay. But they are both tyrosine kinase phosphorylation sites. And you have additional information for this uh, signature, and it tells you that Y is where the phosphorylation happens. So the tyrosine there is uh, being phosphorylated. So if in your protein you see this this uh, site, you see a match to this. Let's say you have an R, A, uh, T, D, um, S, H, Y. Then you could say that tyrosine is a phosphorylated. It can be phosphorylated. Okay. By a tyrosine kinase. So how does this match to this profile? You have an R. So this one is matching. And then you have two amino acids. You satisfy that. You have a D. You satisfy this part. You have an SH. Um, I'm missing one amino acid. Let me just put an I here. You have an SHI. You satisfy this part. Then you have a Y. That part is also satisfied. OK? So if I had in the uh, like the mistake that I did, if you had read the S, H, Y. You couldn't really say this is a tyrosine kinase phosphorylation site because um, you only have two amino acids here, whereas the profile tells you that you should have three. Okay? All right. There are tools online that will check your protein of interest and tells you which um, which profiles match with your protein. How do we build these profiles? So usually uh, the first step is to generate a multiple sequence alignment. You would take the proteins that you think are, um, are sharing the same function and are also um, performing that function in this using in the same manner using the same uh, residues you would multiple sequence multiply align them to find out which residues are highly conserved two of the con uh, we saw the uh, regular expression patterns but there are also other ways uh, one is 
to use um, hidden Markov models. Those are statistical models. Uh, they are very highly uh, quantitative, and they are usually the most successful ones. Okay? They, are, they tend to be very good representations of uh, sequence profiles, but they are hard to come by. You need, uh, you need high fidelity uh, sequences in very large numbers. Okay? So the database called TFAM uh, has hidden Markov model-based profiles. Position-specific scoring matrices are easier to build, and they just contain the frequencies of residues at each position. So let me give you an example. Let's go back to the sequence alignment. So uh, you can generate the multiple sequence alignment and then take each position, let's say the first one, I'm going to list the um, amino acids, 20 of them. So I'm going to build a matrix of 20 amino acids by the length of the alignment or the length of the protein. So an S occurs one time here. An E occurs one time. Um, and H occurs one time. So that's the first position. Okay. Let's take a look at this one uh, where you have L all, all over the place. So the rest are zeros. Um, let me put an L here. So an L occurs four times and the rest are zero. So this table where you look at each column in your multiple alignment and count the number of times each letter occurs is called a position-specific scoring matrix. After you get the frequencies, you, you would usually divide, uh, divide it by the number of sequences, so you get, so all the numbers are between 0 and 1. All right, so you get frequencies instead of counts. If you um, generated a position-specific scoring matrix for this profile, uh, the first position would have um, a 1 for S and zeros everywhere else. Whereas here you have T and S. Let's say T would be uh, 0.6 and S would be 0.4 and the rest would be 0. Okay. So the position specific scoring matrix more or less gives you the same, uh, the same information that you have on this figure. All right, so uh, we saw, we covered uh, pairwise alignments, uh, even though we'll, we'll, we'll see in more detail how to generate them. Uh, we covered multiple sequence alignments and what type of uh, information we get out of it. Um, but we really need a tool that, given a protein, will give us all the other proteins that are related to it. So before we can generate a multiple sequence alignment, we need to collect sequences. And collecting uh, sequence, related sequences involves um, applying pairwise alignment, calculating the scores, and keeping the proteins that um, have a score better than a threshold. All right. A tool that's uh, pretty popular is called BLAST, uh, which stands for Basic Local Alignment Search Tool. Uh, you submit your protein of interest, and it will return um, all the proteins that are uh, similar to it. You can also use this tool to um, submit a DNA sequence and search against either DNA databases or protein databases. And this is a sample report you get. Um, you get the list of sequences. It will tell you... Um, it will give you a score for each one, okay? The E score that we will um, cover in the in the next lecture, how to interpret the E, e score. You, the smaller the E score, the higher uh, the similarity, and the higher the, the the lower the probability that you would be observing that protein by chance. Okay. All right, and then you, you get um, it will give you pairwise alignments. Of your sequence with each of the which with each of the database sequences. So how does BLAST work? 
when you submit your sequence, uh, there are a, a few pre-processing steps that it performs um, so that the search uh, is more accurate. One of the one of these pre-processing steps is called low com is removing low complexity regions. The low complexity regions are regions that are either uh, highly repetitive or it doesn't um, or it, let's say it has the same amino acid repeating. Okay, repetitive sequences are usually low complexity, so it will mask those parts out. Why? Because it's more likely that you would get hits just by chance for those regions. So it removes those regions uh, to prevent um, by chance uh, uh, similarities. All right, so in this case, this region here is removed. That's why you see axis here. So you submit your sequence, and it will uh, mask out those portions. It will not use those portions to initiate the search. All right. And then once, uh, it, after it masks out those regions, what it does, it will chop up your sequence into smaller portions and then find matches for uh, smaller uh, windows and then extend around those small windows. I'll show you the, this at the end of the lecture, how it looks visually. There are different types of blasts that you can use. Uh, PHI blast is called pattern initiated pattern hit initiated blast. Instead of searching for a single sequence, uh, you can search using a position specific scoring matrix. So you are no longer searching for a sequence of letters, but you want to find uh, sequences such that, let's say the first position is 80% uh, of the time A, 20% of the time I. All right, so you can search using that information. PSI blast is called position specific iterative blast, and it internally uses uh, PHI. First, it runs, um, let's say, regular blast, and then it finds the hits, it generates a profile from that. It generates a position specific scoring matrix from that. And using that scoring matrix, position specific scoring matrix, using that profile, it searches the database again to generate new hits. Once it finds the new hits, it again generates a new profile, searches the database again, and you can uh, control how many times it iterates um, or uh, how many sequences are used for generating the profile. Okay. And PSI blast usually gives um, captures more distant homology than regular blast because you are first finding a first set of sequences. And then using those, you, you can find more uh, dissimilar, more sequences that were originally dissimilar to your query sequence. OK. Um, so I said that you can use BLAST to search a protein or a DNA uh, to search against DNA or protein uh, databases. And the different BLAST programs have names depending on what you are querying and what you are, what you are querying against. BLASTP uh, takes a protein and searches, searches against the protein databases. BLASTN uh, takes as input a DNA sequence and searches against uh, DNA databases. So it searches against the genomes. BLASTX takes a DNA sequence from you and searches against the protein databases. How does it... Um, how does it convert? So first, it, it has to convert the DNA to um, a protein, and uh, you could you could do it yourself before you submit. If you know where the genes are located, you can first um, convert it to a protein and then search uh, use BLASTP. But internally, BLAST will take your DNA and look at all the six uh, frames in, of, of your DNA, just like we did in the first lecture. You can you, you can find the codons find the corresponding amino acids, and now you have a protein, okay? But you'll have six different uh, translate, six different uh, frames, which gives you six different proteins, and it would search with all six of them, all right? Okay, T-blast N, you give a protein, and 
um, you search against the database so that the, the translation is done for the database. So similar idea, but you uh, apply, you convert the DNA into a protein sequence before you can do the search. I mean, the BLAST does that for you, you don't have to do it. T-BLAST X uh, takes a DNA, a translated DNA, and searches a translated DNA database. So it's the combination of uh, T-BLAST N and BLAST X. All right. So here there's a there's a comment that saying that protein comparison is more sensitive in detecting remote homologs. Uh, the reason there are several several reasons for that. The most um, the most uh, the, the the most likely one is that uh, when you compare amino acids, there's there's an additional information that you don't have in uh, DNA sequence, and that is um, some amino acids are more compatible with others, and you can evaluate that compatibleness using scoring matrices. Okay, so you have uh, your your comparison is more sensitive when you are looking at the proteins. Another reason is that uh, protein you have 20 proteins, right? Things being the same by chance is less likely for protein sequences. Um, so let's go back to the first uh, first point where you have a substitution matrix for proteins. Uh, you could have a substitution matrix for for DNA also, but in most cases uh, you you will score matches with one, score mismatches with minus one, and so on. So all the matches will be scored the same. All right. So it's more common to just um, score matches uh, the same and not um, not say A is more similar to C or um, a is more similar to T. Okay, so usually you don't say that you have a single score for any match in comparing DNA sequences. But for proteins, that really doesn't make make uh, biological sense. Um, there's a com there's a, a compatible compatibility of amino acids. Some amino acids are more hydrophobic, some are pol polar, and you don't want to uh, replace polars with hydrophobics as often as you would replace polars with polars, okay? All right. So um, another, another uh, point for that, for the, for the first um, claim is that um, the protein sequence is what affects the function of the protein, okay? Um, so the sequence of the protein is uh, gives the function to the protein and it, it gives a structure to the protein. For one amino acid, you could have different codons that give rise to the same amino acid, okay? But once the protein forms, it does, the protein doesn't really care what codons were used to generate that protein, okay? So uh, function is more linked to this uh, sequence of the protein than to the DNA sequence. So as a result, um, protein sequences can give you more, more evolutionary uh, information, more information on homology than DNA can. But once you find the homolog and you are interested in calculating an evolutionary distance, meaning you want to find the time it took for uh, one gene to mutate into another one, that's where you need to look at the DNA sequences. All right, so DNA comparison gives you a more sensitive value for identifying evolutionary distance because now you are looking at the actual number of mutations at the DNA level, all right? So even though the amino acid sequence did not change, uh, you could have codon changes and those uh, mutations uh, give you um, the distance, the time that it took to mutate. Right. So the species trees are usually um, generated using DNA comparison, whereas um, homology searches and functional studies are usually done using protein comparison. Okay. Um, so how do we find the optimal alignment? Given two sequences, how do we generate 
um, the set of correspondences between the two sequences. If we are given two sequences, we want to know which uh, alignment has the maximum score. So we have the two sequences, we know how to evaluate any given alignment. We just add up uh, either by looking at the substitution matrix or by just saying a match is plus one, a mismatch is minus one, a gap is, let's say, minus one. So given those uh, scores, we can look at the alignment and add up all the scores to get a single alignment score for our alignment. But how do we get the alignment that would give us the highest score? If you have two sequences with uh, only 100 residues, um, there are 10 to the, around 10 to the 75 different ways to align the two sequences. And we don't really want to uh, enumerate all of those, find a score to them, and uh, report the best one. Okay, so um, looking at that many different alignments is not feasible. If you had a thousand, a thousand residues, um, then um, you, need, you need to look at 10 to the 600 different ways, and you, uh, that's, not, uh, that's more than you can do in your lifetime. Okay. All right. So we use, uh, in the last lecture, I mentioned that we use dynamic programming to find uh, the solution to the sequence alignment problem. So dynamic programming is uh, a computer science method, and it's about reusing solutions to the smaller problems. So I mentioned this game last lecture where you are given a board, uh, let's say a, a chess board, and there's an amount of money at each uh, cell. You are asked to start from the top left corner and come all the way to the bottom right corner. And each move could be going to the right, going down, or going diagonal at each step. And you want to uh, find the series of steps that will give you the largest sum of money. So at each step you uh, move and then you collect whatever the money is on that cell. All right, so um, I'll leave this as a homework and I'll describe the sequence alignment in more detail. So there are some um, some things that we need to look at before we uh, apply dynamic programming to sequence alignment. So some observations are the following. We know that this, uh, the way that we score an alignment, we score an aligned amino acid pair independently of the others. Okay, so we just, whenever we score a position, uh, its score only depends on the substitution matrix. It doesn't really depend on what its neighbors are. Okay, so each position, each uh, amino acid pair is scored independently. And this is important because of the way, because we are adding a lot, because we are adding the scores, any sub alignment of the longer uh, optimal alignment must also be optimal. Okay, and I'll, I'll give an example to this uh, in, in a sec. Because of this observation, we would be able, we should be able to find the optimal score and the optimal alignment by searching for local optima. And the local optima has a different meaning somewhere else. Uh, by local optima, I mean uh, the optima for smaller chunks of the alignment. Okay. So if by finding the optimal solution to the smaller problems, we should be able to generate the solution to the larger problem. All right, so this, is, uh, this shows the um, second and the first points. Um, let's say we have an alignment that's the best alignment right here. Okay. Then any part of this long alignment should also be optimal. Let's say we take this portion. All right. So this sub 
sub alignment, the sub portion of the longer alignment should also be optimal in itself without looking at what the rest of the two sequences uh, are. Uh, let's uh, prove this by contradiction. Let's say that there was another alignment where you shift A to that, which has a better score. Okay? If that were the case, then if we plug this in back to the longer alignment, that should have a larger score. Okay? So this would have been the best alignment if that was the case. So that's a proof by contradiction. Uh, we say, therefore, um, any part of it should also be optimal. Okay? All right. So given a large alignment, optimal alignment, if you take any smaller portion of it, that should also in itself be optimal. There should not be a better way to align that smaller portion. So using this uh, observation, we can um, generate a table where, where um, we are adding an alignment with I and J. Okay, so when we are considering a position from uh, protein 1 position A, the second protein position J, if we are looking at how to align those two positions, we have three options. We have three sub-solutions uh, sub that we uh, need to look at. The first sub-solution is where we have aligned all the way to I minus 1 from protein 1 and all the way to J from protein 2. So that portion. And we are going down. That means we are adding a new residue in the first position and we are aligning it with a gap in the second protein. All right? The second option is where we have calculated uh, the alignment all the way to I minus 1 and J minus 1 in the first and second proteins. And we are aligning I with J um, from the first and the second proteins. Okay? And the last option is uh, this one where we are introducing a gap in the second protein. Let me, let me give you the, these three examples. Um, let's say we have A, B, C, A, B, C, and let's say I equals um, 4, and uh, let's make J also equal to 4, for simplicity, okay? All right, so um, we are looking at aligning uh, this D with, uh, let's say, F in the second protein, okay? So the first option is where um, everything has been aligned before that, and we are aligning D with F. So there may be gaps previously. We don't really care how the previous alignment looks. All we care is what its score is and that the knowledge that it, it was generated optimally. If we are aligning D with F, we take whatever score the previous portion had and add the score of aligning D with F, okay? So we are coming from there and adding score of aligning D with F. So this portion, that score is aligning this one. Then we just add up aligning the fourth, the fourth position with the uh, fourth position in the second one, adding up the uh, score to the alignment and getting this uh, score. But we are not done yet. We need to compare that score with two other scores, and that is uh, having aligned that portion, so it's A, B, C, and um, A, B, C, D, all right, so I'm just, I'm just writing it out, there may be gaps in the alignment, we don't really care how they were aligned, all we care is that we have a score for that optimal alignment, and then we are adding, uh, sorry, this was an F. So F, we are adding a D here, but now we are um, aligning it with a gap. All right, so we are coming down here. Everything has been uh, taken care of up to that point, and we are introducing a new residue in the first 
sequence, but we are not introducing anything new in the second sequence. We are introducing a gap. All right, so we are consuming a new residue in the first sequence, in the first protein. We are introducing a gap in the second protein. So the score of this one will be whatever the score of that was. So it's this right here, plus uh, the gap penalty. So let's, let me call it G. So this is SI minus one, comma J plus G. All right, so this is the second uh, option that I have where D aligns with a gap. The third option is where I have aligned up to D from the first sequence and up to C in the second sequence and I need an I need to align F and I'm aligning with a gap. So this portion has already been taken care of over here. Okay. And I'm moving in this direction. That means I'm consuming a new residue from the second protein, and I'm introducing a gap in the first one. So the score of this alignment will be whatever the score of that portion was. So it's S I comma J minus one plus G plus the gap. All right. So at any position, I J. Um, I have three scores to calculate. I have three options. One of them is aligning I with J. All right, so aligning those two residues, and that could either be a match or a mismatch, but I'm corresponding those two residues. So that is the score of up to this point plus the score of aligning uh, residue I from the first one with the residue J from the second one. So this can be looked up from the substitution matrix, or if you are given that a match is a plus one uh, and a mismatch is minus one, then you then you need to look at the two residues that you are aligning. If they are matching, you would uh, replace this with a one. If they are mismatching, you, you would replace that with a minus one. Okay. All right. So that's the first option. The second option is uh, coming down from that direction, which means you've taken care of this part. We don't really care how we took care of it um, as, uh, yet. And then we add the gap penalty to it. The last option is coming down in this direction, and then you add the gap penalty to it. You calculate these three sums, find out which one was highest, and that would be the path that you would be taking to get to this point. All right? So once, once you get to this point, then you can move in other directions. All right? Okay, so at each location, we have three options to calculate. We calculate it, and we find which one has the highest score, and that's going to be the path that we take. And as we do this, we also need to keep track of uh, which one was the uh, highest score. So we need to... Uh, let's say this, keep these arrows if this one gave me the highest score. And those paths, those arrows will be important when I'm trying to find the act, find the alignment uh, instead of just the score of the alignment. Okay, so um, I need to generate a table of scores for aligning subsequences and then build this table up that will give me the score of aligning the two sequences in their entirety. Um, I, uh, I'm going to initialize this dynamic programming table, this dynamic alignment in al alignment table. Um, can you push the power button twice? One more time? Good, thank you. All right, so the first row and the first column are representing gaps. Okay, so remember, anytime I go to the, to the right or anytime I go down, I'm introducing gaps in one sequence. Okay, so the first position will have a score of zero, and then I am introducing I, but not introducing anything in this uh, on these on this side in the first sequence. Uh, let me call this um, P. Let me call this Q. 
right? So I'm moving it to the right. That means I am uh, introducing a new residue in Q, but no residues in P. That means I'm introducing a gap in P. So this will be I aligned with a gap. Move to the right again, S with gap. Move to the right again, A with gap, and so on. Okay. And here I'm using a linear gap penalty. Each time you add a new gap, you are adding uh, a new uh, minus A to your total score. So there's only one way uh, you could go uh, to any of these uh, cells. It's coming from the left side. Similarly, we can, I can fill in the first column. Um, so there's only one way to get there. You get minus 8, minus 16, minus 24, and each of those moves uh, correspond to introducing a gap in the protein Q. So this first move, uh, you have a T aligning with a gap. The second move, you have an H aligned with a gap. Okay? So up to this point, if you wanted to find the score of that, those two um, pairs of uh, amino acid residues, it's minus 8 plus minus 8, you get minus 16, all right? So it's this, this one right here. So the score that appears in this um, alignment table is the optimal score for aligning up to that point. And up to that point means you have nothing in Q yet, and you have something in P. So you have uh, gaps, all gaps in Q, and you have no gaps in P. Once you fill in the first row and the first column, we can start filling in the rest of the table. So let's look at this position right here. I have three options going coming from the diagonal. Okay. Coming from the diagonal would mean I'm aligning I with T. TI. So it's this one right here. And before that, it's empty. There's nothing uh, coming before it. The sequences were empty before that. The score of this option is going to be the, uh, the score of aligning T, T with I. And I think I'm using um, the Blossom 62 substitution matrix to align these two sequences. Okay? So aligning T with I, uh, let me double check this. Um, This is plus six. This is plus four. It looks like I'm using the substitution matrix. Okay. Let me feel, let me look at this table now. All right. So you are aligning T with I. Okay. So that means you uh, add a minus one to zero. The other two options were going down like that, that would have given you minus 16, because each gap is scored as minus 8. So that would have given you minus 16. This one would also have given you minus 16. So we don't follow those two paths, those two arrows. The correct uh, way to go like that. All right. So we have this number. Next, we, can, we have enough information to calculate this number right here. There are three options going like that, going down, going to the uh, right, we find which one has the highest score and we calculate it. All right. Uh, and the next one, we can either go down like that, like that, like that. It, uh, it looks like going this way has the highest score. It gives you the largest number, so we keep that one. So you keep the arrows that give you the largest uh, number, and you build this dynamic align uh, alignment table. And when you are done, you start from the end and follow the arrows that lead to that point. All right, so this arrow leads here, this arrow leads there, and all the way to the beginning. Okay? So once you've identified, once you've backtracked the arrows, you can find the corresponding alignment uh, for all of those arrows. So going like that means you are adding D, but not adding anything in the uh, first protein P. That means D aligns with a gap from the first protein. 
And then from uh, from then on, the rest are uh, straightforward. Any diagonal means you are aligning those two residues. Uh, e with E, and then uh, N with N, G with I, and so on. So you got this picture right here. Okay, so in the previous example, gaps were parallelized as minus a, but that was too large for gap. And that's why we had uh, all diagonals. When your gap penalty is too high, gaps will be very unfavorable, and your alignment score will have uh, your alignment table will have scores where uh, diagonals are more common than taking gap moves. In this example, we have reduced the gap penalty. Um, well, we've increased the number from minus A to minus four. Okay, so gaps have become more favorable now. Again, we fill in the first row and the first column, and it's just um, minus four, minus eight, and so on, because we are using a linear gap penalty. Um, but now, um, gaps are better options. So if you look at this, let me see, if you look at this one right here, so you have three options. You find out which of the three has the best value. If uh, you had a gap penalty that was uh, worse, uh, you would have preferred coming from diagonal, but gaps are more favorable in this example. That's why we uh, get that portion, okay? Once we are at the end, uh, we find our score, which is seven, and we start going backward following the arrows that lead to that point and we generate our alignment uh, that corresponds to that path. Let's do that. So here you are taking an arrow to the right, that means D is aligning with a gap. And then a diagonal means an E is aligned with an E. And then another diagonal, um, N is aligned with N. So that's that diagonal right there. And then there's a gap. So you are introducing this G, but uh, not um, introducing a gap in the first protein. So it's like that. And then a gap, and then a diagonal means I is aligned with I. Another diagonal, L with L. All right, I'm at this point. I have a gap, which means A is aligned with a gap. And then a diagonal, S with S. Another diagonal, I with I. And then a gap going down means you have, an, uh, you have a um, residue in the first protein and a gap in the second one. And then the last gap is introducing T uh, and you have a gap in the, in the second protein. Okay? So you are following the path backward and generating the alignment starting from the last position. Okay? All right. So let's do this example um, where we'll find the optimal alignment of these two sequences. And I'll do this on the board. And we are asked to score a match as a plus one, a mismatch with zero, and a gap to be minus one. Um, okay. 
Let me see if I have enough room to do it on the computer. Okay, so... Okay, so um, I usually show the first protein uh, along the rows, but let me change that because the screen is not laid out that way. So... My... My pen is messed up now. But I'm gonna move the screen. So I'm gonna draw a large table and start building the uh, support. So I have A, C, A, G. C, C, G, and A, A, C. And the second sequence is make sure to leave an extra row and extra empty row to represent the gap. I have A, C, D, then T, uh, so A, C, C, D, and then T, C, C, D. So in the next uh, exercise, we have uh, sh two shorter sequences, and you are asked to find the optimal alignment of those two sequences, but now gap is a minus one, instead of telling you that a match is something and a mismatch is something, I'm giving you this substitution matrix. So anytime you go diagonal, you have to look up the score of aligning those two residues from the substitution matrix. Okay. I'll give you a few minutes to work on this uh, while I go get um, a blackboard, a whiteboard cleaner. All right, so um, if you are comparing a short sequence with a long sequence, uh, you will have gaps at the end, right? Uh, because uh, um, if, if, you see if a short sequence is highly similar to a shorter portion of a long sequence, then there will be gaps um, around the short sequence to compensate for, for what's, what it's missing at the end. But that will mean that you have a very large uh, gap, and a, a large uh, gap score will give you a small uh, overall alignment score for, the, for aligning two sequences, even, even though the short sequence was highly similar to a portion of the large sequence. So for those cases where you have two proteins that, ha that are of different, of very different length, we use free end gaps, meaning we don't penalize the gaps that appear at the end of the sequences. Uh, we, they are just zeros, okay? So we don't penalize them with a minus score. Um, so that's part of the that's part of the scoring. We need to change. We need to make corresponding changes in uh, our alignment. Table in the way that we generate in the way that we calculate the optimal alignment to match that free end gap idea. So the changes that we make is are the following: first, instead of um, setting the first row and the first column to be uh, multiple multiples of the uh, align multiples of the gap penalty, now they are all zeros, okay? Because the gap the, when they appear at the at the ends. Uh, they are scored as zero. The first row and the first column uh, represent the gaps that you put at the beginning of a sequence. 
All right, that's why we set them to zero. So they are not penalized. And after we finish our alignment table, now instead of starting from the last corner, the bottom right corner, we look at the last row and the last column and we find the highest number. Okay, so instead of starting from three, we'll scan the last row and the last column. The largest number is 11, and that's where the alignment starts. Anything beyond that? So the letter D um, from, the, uh, from the second sequence is aligned with a gap, but that's a free gap, okay? So we start from 11, go all the way to zero, and anything, any residues that are not aligned from the first sequence and from, from the second sequence are aligned as a gap. Okay? So this is the free end gaps. And when you are finding the score of this alignment, um, the gaps at the end are zeros, and then you, keep, you continue uh, scoring just you would normally do, uh, aligning I with an I, add that to aligning S with an S, and so on. Okay? But the end gaps do not penalize. They, they just get zero. All right. So the next idea is um, doing local alignment. When, you, when we built this alignment table just now, it was a global alignment. All right. Uh, but in local alignment, we don't want to align the sequences in their entirety. We, we want to find a section, a local section from the two sequences that are highly similar. All right. So we need to, again, make corresponding changes to our algorithm to, to be able to find those local alignments. So this example shows three portions uh, from the two sequences. The blue portion is not very similar. The green portion is a highly similar local alignment, and the red portion is, again, not similar. If, we, if you did a global alignment, you, are, you would be forcing the entire sequence to align, uh, but sequence, the sub-portions that are not similar uh, are also aligning but they should not really be part of the alignment, all right? So uh, this says local alignment may have higher score than overall global alignment. So in this table, uh, an, a square, a cell uh, in the table may have a larger score than the bottom right corner, okay? So instead of focusing on the bottom right corner, we'll have to look at the entire table and find that largest number. So, um, to make changes in our algorithm, here's what we do. We again set the first row and the first column to zeros, just like in the free end gaps, all right? Because the end gaps will not be penalized uh, in case um, uh, our local alignment starts from the uh, first position in, the, in one sequence and anywhere in the other sequence, okay? So we don't want to penalize those gaps. Secondly, when we are scoring each position uh, of the table, we have now a fourth option, which is zero. So we make it so that we never go below zero. In the global alignment, we had these three, and we our numbers could go below zero, so they could have minus numbers. But in local alignment, if anything goes um, minus, we set it to zero, okay? So if all three options you had give you a negative number, uh, you will just set um, that the, the score for that cell to be zero. And that allows you to sort of reset where the alignment starts. Okay. And when we are done, instead of looking at the last uh, row, last column, or anywhere along that line, you look at the entire table, find the largest number. In this case, it's 19 and then do backtracing like you normally would by following the arrows that leading to it, that lead to it. And you stop as soon as you hit a zero. And that zero can occur in the first row, first column, or anywhere within the table. So if this were a zero, then this, that's where you would stop and your local alignment would be this much, okay? All right, so that helps you extract a portion from one sequence and a portion from the second sequence instead of aligning them entirely. All right, in some cases, you would be interested in more than one local alignment. Um, all right, so here, here's an example of local alignment. Uh, we, build up, we build up our table. The largest number is 14. And these are the um, sequences of 
arrows that we follow. Actually, not that. Uh, we have two different paths. We have three different paths that give the same score. One is that, one is that, one is that. Okay? So you can either go like that, go up, left, up, uh, uh, diagonal. Okay? So all these um, three options will give you three different alignments. One where is a gap like that, one where you align A with B, and one where you uh, switch the positions of the gaps. So if they have the same score, they will have the same um, numbers, the, the same uh, numerical value, but different arrows leading to the same position. So you get three different alignments when you follow the, when you backtrace the paths, okay? In, in some cases, especially when you have uh, proteins that contain multiple domains, you may not be interested in a single, a single local alignment, but uh, want to find all local alignments. All right, so different portions of the sequences may be similar, and you want to find all of such uh, similarities. To find those, we make the following changes in our algorithm. First, we find the local alignment that we normally would, okay? And then we set those positions to be zeros. So this is the first alignment that we found. And we hold them at zero. We rebuild our table with those um, scores and forced to be zeros. So even if your three options give a higher score for those positions, you still keep them at zero. You rebuild your table with those and forced as zero and find the next highest number, which is five. And you get a different local alignment. And when you do this, you find all sets of um, local alignments between the two sequences. Okay? And I'll, I'll describe the rest of this um, PowerPoint in the next lecture. It requires the homework.